So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, or reintroduce Mladen Bestina for uh, the third and final uh, talk from the Sassenhaus lecture series. Um, so Mladen is going to speak about automorphism groups of free groups. And, uh, thank you, thank you, John. The <laughs> uh, lengthy introduction. <laughs> Very lengthy. <laughs> Everyone knows I like to talk. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, so suppose I tell you that the you know simplest interesting topological space is the circle, and then I ask you, you know, what do you consider to be the second uh, most interesting topological space, or maybe not a single space, but maybe a family of spaces. You know, that comes after the circle. You, know, you study the circle for a while, and you say, okay, now I understand the circle. What would be the next? Uh, what would be the next space or a class of spaces? So, so I think I think the opinions would differ, right? So they're they're kind of they're t uh, so so here are the proposed answers, and then you tell me if you if if I missed some. Okay, so uh, <coughs> S one so S one is the simplest. We sort of agreed with that. So then you can you can kind of start taking Cartesian products, and I don't want to say S one squared, S one cubed, right? So it's just the whole family. So S one to the n. That's uh. So in other words, the n torus. Okay? That could be one possible generalization of the circle. Another is, well, the circle is a compact one manifold, so maybe we go up to dimension two and we say compact two manifolds, right? So we can say surfaces. And then finally, we there, uh, you know, circle is one dimensional, but there are more complicated one dimensional spaces, namely graphs. Right? Maybe finite graphs. I don't know. Everything is compact here. I'll just say graphs. Okay, does anybody else have a, a fourth one? <laughs> okay, well this, this seems like a natural thing, right? And so the point is that uh, these, these uh, classes of spaces lead to symmetry groups that are uh, studied in geometric group theory um, you know, quite a bit. So here the symmetry group is, is you know, SLN Z. Um, right? any, any element of SLN Z is going to act on Rn and also to preserve the integer lattice, so it'll act on the torus. And more generally, maybe we'll, we could say arithmetic groups. Um, surfaces, well, what are symmetries of surfaces? Well, they're mapping class groups. So, mapping. And I mentioned that yesterday, and then maybe I didn't say it quite as much as I thought in the beginning, but anyway, uh, there they are. And then symmetries of graphs. So here you can, I mean, surfaces, you can talk about homeomorphisms. With graphs, you don't really want to talk about homeomorphisms. You know, there are lots of homotopy equivalent graphs that are not homeomorphic, so you really want to talk about homotopy equivalences of graphs. So a group of homotopy equivalences of, a, say, a finite graph, well, that's going to be out Fn. The fundamental group of a graph is free, and the automorphism, any homotopy equivalence of the graph will induce an automorphism of the fundamental group. And there's no, I, I'm not putting a base point anywhere, so. Uh, this is really so that you take all automorphisms and then you divide by by the inner automorphisms. Okay, so that's the that's the group. Okay, so these are the, the what's considered to be the three great families of groups in geometric group theory. And today I'll I'll I guess I'll feature this one. I'll talk about this. All right. Um, so all, the, all of these groups have kind of a, there's a basic space where these groups act properly and, and um, uh, on, on some kind of a contractible space. So here, here you can think about the uh, symmetric space, right? Here it's the symmetric space. And in this case for SLNZ, it would be, um, it would be um, SLNR modulo SLN, right? That's a contractible, nice non-positive curve. Manifold and S L and Z acts properly on it, and more maybe more geometrically, more concretely, you can think of this as being the space of um, um, say a vol a flat tori, or maybe I should uh, flat marked tori of volume one. Right? If you have a if you have a lattice, you have a you have a, well, you have Z to the n sitting inside the R R n. And then you hit hit it with a matrix in S L N R. You'll get another lattice. You can divide R n by that lattice, and you'll get a flat torus of volume one. 
Now, moreover, this, uh, this torus is, is marked because you, um, you can remember the standard basis that you started out with, with z, z to the n. So another way to think about the marking is that the fundamental group of the torus, which is z to the n, comes with an identification with your standard z to the n. Yeah, there's, it comes with an isomorphism between z to the n and the fundamental group of the torus. Okay, for surfaces, uh, we have the Teichmuller space. And the Teichmuller space, well, this is for really for hyperbolic surfaces. I mean, if, uh, if the genus is uh, 0 or 1, then, then you know, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, there, there's some, like if you're interested in, in the torus, then you, then you really want to put a puncture and think of it as a cusp in the, you know, so in the hyperbolic world. But anyway, so you, you can, we can think about hyperbolic surfaces. And the, the analog of the semantic space is the Teichmuller space, and you can con more concretely think of this as being the, the space of um, hyperbolic, hyperbolic metrics on the surface uh, with, with marking. And the, the metrics are, yeah, they're, they're up to isomorphism. Um, anyway, so there's a space of hyperbolic surfaces with, with the marking. So here the, the curvature is going to be negative, so you cannot put the flat metric, but you, you, you consider hyperbolic metrics. And then over here we'll have uh, what's called outer space. This is color Volkman's outer space. Okay, so the, the name comes from, of course, of course out. Outer space. And what is it in this more concrete terms? Well, it's the space of uh, uh, marked, um, marked um, uh, metric graphs with volume one. Okay. So here you cannot rescale. So here I don't have to say volume one. Uh, if, when you rescale hyperbolic metric, you don't really get a hyperbolic. You get a negative curve metric, but the curvature won't be minus one. But with these flat metrics, you you have to s uh, normalize the volume to be one. Okay, so first I want to explain more about what this means, what these words mean, what outer space is, and then we'll draw a picture of it in rank two. When n is two, that's really the best you can do. In higher rank, there, you know, there's no way you're going to draw a picture of it. Um, and then. Uh, and then we'll maybe go into, um, there, there's a certain metric on outer space called the Lipschitz metric, so I'll talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get to train tracks. But you say what the volume of the graph means? Yeah, yeah, I'll say that, I'll say that. Okay? So first of all, what is a graph? So to me, a graph is, is finite. It's a finite uh, one complex, cell, uh, cell complex, so you can have loops and stuff, parallel edges. Finite one complex, and there are no vertices of uh, valence one or two. Okay, a marking. So the marking this, we're interested in a particular n here. Okay, so I'm going to fix. Uh, so a marking is going to be a homotopy equivalence um, from um, from this row. So this is uh, this is the the wedge of circles from 1 to n to the graph gamma. Okay, so I have a, a graph gamma, and I have a homotopy equivalence. That's a marking. That's going to identify the fundamental group of the graph with the fundamental group of this, of this graph that you fix once and for all. So that's so really with fn up to inner um, automorphism. OK. and. Um, what is, what is a, a, a metric graph? So, so there is a, a length function. So a metric graph. So this is a graph equipped with with a, with a, a, a length function. So L, this goes from the set of edges of, of gamma to zero infinity. So we're just imagining that to, to every edge, we are assigning a, a, a positive real number. And um, what, what we think of, so we, we draw some graph here, and now we have some you know, lengths here, maybe 3, 4, 7, 
They don't have to be integers or anything. They can be just real numbers. Uh, but we, we imagine that, that these edges are made from segments of, in the real line, in the real line uh, of length that's specified by, the, by that number. So this turns the graph into a, into a geodesic space. So this, this gamma is now a geodesic space. So for instance, if I, have a, if I have a path in the graph, I can measure its length. You can think of this as being, I mean, these edges are really, if you want, Riemannian manifolds. So I can measure lengths of paths. OK. Um, the volume is just a sum. So the volume of gamma is the sum of the lengths of edges. In, uh, Okay, so when I, so when I say I normalize the volume to be 1, I want the sum of these numbers to be 1. Okay. Now, one thing you can do here is you can measure lengths of conjugacy classes. So if I have a, so if, um, let's say if alpha is a conjugacy class in, um, in Fn, Right, and so then, then alpha is represented by a loop. By a loop in, um, in this wedge of circles. And then I can, I can push it, so I didn't give a name to a marking, let's say it's f. Then I can push it by this f and I'll get the loop in my graph gamma. And then I can tighten it there. I want a loop that doesn't backtrack. I can tighten it and then I can measure its length. OK, so I can define the length of alpha with respect to this graph gamma, uh, which is equipped with, uh, so here in this notation, I'm dropping the, uh, the marking and the length. But assume the gamma is equipped with the marking and the length. Well, then what I want to do is I take f of alpha. This is going to be some loop in, in gamma. And then there's this bracket notation. This means that uh, you tighten and then take the length of that. OK, Okay, so that's one little operation you can perform. Yes? So have volume one? Uh, volume one. Okay. Yeah, I want to, the, this is the definition of volume. Yeah, yes, I want, I want the volume. So I haven't defined what outer space is yet. But the, the outer space will be made up of these graphs at volume one. Okay. So, the, so this length is with respect to that? The length is with respect to the, this function L. Yeah, so the graph is equipped with this length function. And then I can, I can measure the length of any conjugacy class. Okay. Now, um, okay. So now let's define outer space. Just want to make sure we forget anything here. Okay. So outer space. So this is uh, CVN for Colin Rothman. This paper appeared in the mid '80s, and this was really the big. Um, I like to say it was the big bang. It created outer space. <laughs> And uh, it, it's, I mean, this is really, there were, there are older results about OutFN, you know, going back to Nielsen 100 years ago, 1920s. But the uh, real study, modern study of outer space or of OutFN really started with, uh, with their paper. Okay, so what is it? It's the, it's the set of, well, I have to define topology later, but it's a set of all um, marked heterographs. Of volume one. So these are so it's really a triple gamma um, gamma FL, and then there is an equivalence relation. So subject to the equivalence relation. Okay. So what is the equivalence relation? So I, I take um, so here is my rows wedge of S one to one to n. And I have a, a function f that goes to gamma, and I have another one that goes to gamma prime, so it's f prime. So when do I view these as being equivalent? Well, if I, if I have an isometry here, if there's an isometry like this, so that this diagram commutes up to homotopy, okay, then I'm going, to regard, I'm going to regard these. So gamma f l is then equivalent to gamma prime f prime l prime. OK? All right, so, so let's, oh, why is it so loud now? <laughs> OK, um, so let me, let me draw the picture 
in rank 2. Okay, see, if I fix a typical graph in rank 2, it's like one of those theta graphs, and I vary the length, so I have three numbers that add up to 1, that's going to be a, a 2 simplex. Okay, so the, the picture will start by, by um, you know, I'll have a, here's a 2 simplex. Now, why did I uh, delete the vertices? Well, because the vertices will correspond to uh, the, you know, two of those lengths being 0. And that's not allowed. If you, you know, length zero means that you're collapsing that edge to a point, and uh, the uh, you know you're not allowed to collapse two of those. You can only do one. So, for example, here, you know, in the very center will correspond to a to a theta graph, so that all three uh, lengths are one third. And then, as you approach one of the sides, then you'll get a rose. You'll get a wedge of two circles. You collapsed, say, the middle edge here. If you approach Another side, you'll be collapsing another edge, and, and so on. So there are, three, there are three sides here. You can th collapse three different edges. Now, what happens, what happens next? Suppose you want to cross into the next triangle here. So how do you do this? Well, you, you want to uncollapse, but you don't want to uncollapse you know, and go back into the same triangle. So what you do is you flip one of these circles over, and then you uncollapse. So over here, this is also going to be uh, you know, a, a, a two simplex that corresponds to some marked g theta graph, but uh, but but you know only you, you don't get it's it's going to be a different marking than than in the triangle over here. They will only match up when you collapse one of these edges to to a point, and and you can you can keep doing this. So you'll have a you know you'll have another triangle here, another triangle here, and uh, and you've seen this picture before, for example yesterday. Um, this is the this is just a fairy graph that, that we're constructing here. So, well, it's a filled-in fairy graph. There, this is the one skeleton, and then we're we are filling it in with two simplices. So this is this is a part of outer space in rank two. There's still there's another um, there's another type of graph that, that's not drawn in yet. Namely, uh, there are there are these uh, graphs of this shape, the barbell graphs. And they will also correspond to a two simplex, but this time we'll have to delete not only the, ver uh, the, the, the vertices, but also two of the sides. So, so these sides are also deleted, because you're not allowed to collapse a circle to a point. That wouldn't give you a rank two graph. That would not, not be homotopy equivalent to rows anymore. So, you, so these are the sort of the fins that you have to attach. So the, the, the edge over here at the bottom is already in this picture. When you collapse the middle edge here, then you just get the rows. And those already exist in this picture here. So you have to attach. So each one of these fins gets attached to one of the edges. OK? So you have, a, you know, you have an, an edges correspond to these marked roses. And you can just insert uh, a separating edge. To get uh, to get the fin, okay. Okay, and uh, so this is uh, th this this is not quite a simplicial complex because there are some faces missing, but it's a it's a complex complex of simplices with missing faces. Okay, but you can define the topology in the same way you define the topology on a simplicial complex. It's just it's a weak topology with respect to these simplices. Um, all right, so does that make sense? Any questions here about the outer space? So it's not, you can see that this is not a manifold. The space is not a manifold because we attach these fins. Now we could say, well, let's not attach the fins. Let's just look at the graphs without separating edges, and that would be fine. But, uh, but this issue is unavoidable in higher rank. So you, the, in higher rank, the, this is just irreparably not a manifold. It's, a, it's some kind of a polyhedron, but it's not a manifold. <coughs> the theorem, the main theorem of Culler and Boltman is that this space is contractible. Just like, uh, just like the symmetric space and technical space. And yet one proof of this, there are several proofs by now of this fact. One proof is uh, just using the peel morse theory. OK. Um, now, there is a, the, the reason this uh, space is important is that 
the group out of n is acting on it. Okay, so what's the action? Action of out of n. So here it's convenient to think of out of n as being the, the group of homotopy equivalences from, uh, you know, from the rows. I should have called it R or something, but anyway, it's the wedge of circles from 1 to n to itself up to homotopy. Okay, I, can, I want to view this group as being, being this. And so then the action is on the right. Okay, these change of marking actions are always on the right. So if I take phi in here, so let's say I take an automorphism phi, and I think of it as a homotopy equivalence, then what's the action? Well, I take gamma um, fl, and I apply phi. Well, so what's the picture here, right? You have, you have this uh, wedge of S1s into, into gamma, and there's this phi like this. So the only thing you can do is compose. You do phi, you first do phi, and then you do f. So this is going to be gamma. So you do, you, it's the same graph, the same length function, but the marking changes by phi, so it's f phi. And that's why it's the right action. You first do phi, and then you do f. Okay, that's the action. And if you think about this, this is a, this is a simplicial. It's, it, it's the action that just permutes these simplices. Okay, so it permutes simplices. And um, it turns out it's a proper action. The stabilizer of any simplex is essentially just a symmetry group of that graph. Or, so it's a proper, proper action. However, it's not co-compact. That seems pretty clear. There are, there are only finitely many orbits of simplices, but the uh, simplices are not compact here. You know, they have these missing paces, and that's going to make the action not co-compact. OK. Um, however, there is a, a compact, there is a nice co-compact uh, co subspace, namely the spine. So this is also what Kaller Motman did. You know, if we have a simplex with missing faces, there is a natural spine you know, inside it. That that uh, the you know the complement of the, of these missing faces, deformation of the e so, so in this case, it would be you know it would be this. Just a bit like this is going. You take the barycentric subdivision and you take you take simplices in the barycentric subdivision that um, that are disjoined from the missing faces. And so you you you, you take the union of those things, and that's going to also be a, a contractible space of. Uh, smaller dimension, and out of n acts on this, co-compactly. What happens to these fins? Yeah, so the fins, the spine is goes like this. It's kind of a silly thing, right? It just that it's valence one things. Okay. Right. Okay, so uh, so they they imp improved on this earlier theorem of Nielsen. Nielsen's theorem was that the that out of n is it's a finitely presented group. And this uh, kind of immediately proves that because we have a co-compact action on a contractible uh, space. But in fact, you also get all these other finiteness properties. So they, they actually computed um, the virtual cohomological dimension, so finiteness properties. So it has, out of n has a you know, virtually finite classifying space. There are finiteness properties. They computed the, the VCD, the virtual cohomological dimension of the group. It's just the dimension of the spine. Um, OK, and they, they did various other things. Um, OK, so this is kind of the basic topological side of out of n. This is the basic space where out of n is acting. And uh, now, the next, I'd like to talk about the metric on this space. Just like in, if, you, if you think about um, you know, mapping class groups, then, then one thing you have to consider is, is you know, technical metric on the technical space. Well, uh, th this is kind of the best metric. That the one we're, I'm going to describe to you is the best metric we have on, on outer space. And it's called the Lipschitz metric. OK, so let's talk about the Lipschitz metric. CVN. So um, if I have, so I mean, schematically, here is CVN, and then I have two points, and I'd like to measure the distance between them. There's gamma and there's gamma prime. 
And then I have this rows that gives me the, the markings. There's F and there's F prime. And the point of this is that there's a natural homotopy equivalence from gamma to gamma prime that comes from this picture, namely the one that makes this triangle commute. So I have a, I have a map here, maybe I'll call it phi. So phi from gamma to gamma prime is um, difference of markings. Okay, so it's a, it's a homotopy equivalence that commutes with markings. With markings of, of gamma and gamma prime. So it's only well defined up to homotopy, right? You, you, can, you can homotopy it around, but there, that homotopy class of maps is well defined, just from this picture. And now what we'd like to do is minimize the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so we can always make this map Lipschitz. For example, we can make sure that all edges are mapped in a linear way with a constant slope. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's certainly Lipschitz maps in this homotopy class, and we'd like to, what did I do? <laughs> Probably nothing. Um, we'd like to minimize. See if this does anything. Yep, it does. Well, Although the, the lights run away. Will that turn the lights back on? Where do you turn the lights on? Is it over here? I don't know. Oh, here. System is shutting down, it says. <laughs> it's shutting down the projector. But I don't know how to turn the lights on. Oh, there you go. They came on. <laughs> Thank you. She's our audio visual person. <laughs> um, okay, so I want to just minimize the Lipschitz constant, okay? So the so if uh, so phi is one of these maps, I, I'm going to denote, denote by, so this is like the L infinity norm, if you want, of the derivative or something. So this is the, um, the maximal, uh, maximum Lipschitz, I don't know, Lipschitz uh, constant, or ma maximal slope, maximal Lipschitz constant over the edges, the edges of gamma. I'll, I'll give you examples pretty, pretty soon. Right, so you, you're looking at, I mean, these maps are C1 if you want, and you're looking at the derivative, and uh, you want to look at the maximal value of the derivative over all, over all edges. That's the Lipschitz constant. And I want to define uh, the, uh, the distance from gamma to gamma prime to be the, the infimum of the log of, of this number phi prime over, over phi uh, being the difference of markings. Okay, so I, I vary this map over the whole homotopy class, and I look at the minimal possible Lipschitz constant and take its log. Okay? That's, the, that's what I want to call the distance between gamma and gamma prime. All right, so let's, uh, let's look at some examples first before we get into what, some basic properties of this. Um, so, say again? That would be the distance from gamma prime to gamma. So, okay, so the big secret here is this distance function is not going to be symmetric. Okay. You so, symmetrize it or not? No, no, we'll live with the non symmetric metric. Non -symmetric. There's a good reason for that, which we'll, I, I think, we'll get to. So it's minimum, you're all maximum, you meant minimum, right? Well, the phi prime is maximum, no, but, the, prime. but then I take the infimum. So given the map, right, I want to look at the maximal slope that I see. And then I minimize over the maximum. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Can you provide, make, well, make, make an, example, an example? Yeah, this is what I, that's, that's what's coming. Yeah. OK, so let's compute the distance. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take one of those triangles that we just discussed over here. and. The graph A is going to be the midpoint of this edge, and B is going to be the bare center of the triangle. So A is, A is this graph here. It's 1 half, 1 half, like this. And then uh, B is this graph, 
where this is one third, one third, one third. And the difference of markings, um, so if I, go, if I go from, so this is A, this is B. If I go from B to A, then I would collapse the middle edge. If I want to go the other way, then I want to send, I'm going to send the, the vertex A to the middle of, the, of this edge over here, and then I'm going to send the red loop, I'm going to send the red loop over here, and then I'm going to send the yellow loop like this, and I'm going to send it like this. Okay, so that's my map. That's one of the maps in this homotopy class, but I claim that's the best one. Okay, so what is the slope? The slope on, on this loop is, so, so one half will go to two thirds, right? So two thirds divided by one half is four thirds. So the slope here is four thirds. And the other one is the same because it's symmetric. And so this tells me, this tells me that the distance from A to B is, if you want, less than or equal than log of 4 thirds. But in fact, they're equal, because you're not going to be able to do better, right? Because here is this loop of length 1 half that has to get mapped to this loop of length uh, 2 thirds. So you're not going to be able to do this with the, you know, with the map that, that's a Lipschitz constant less than 4 thirds. OK. Now what about going the other way? So the, the slope on the middle edge over here is going to be 0 because it gets collapsed. And then these two edges have length 1 third, and they get mapped to 1 half. So that means that um, the, so the, the Lipschitz constant is 1 half divided by 1 third. That's 3 halves. Right? So going the other way, the distance from b to a is log 3 halves. And you can see that they're not equal. <clears throat> um, and just another quick example, um, if I take um, the same A, but now I take C to be on the same edge, but very close to the missing uh, face. So then A is, A looks like this, and C looks like this, right? There's A, there's C. This is maybe 1 minus epsilon, this is epsilon, and these are 1 half and 1 half. So the distance from A to C is, well, it's a, uh, I mean, this 1 half will get stretched to 1 minus epsilon. So this will be log of, of uh, 1 minus epsilon over 2 over 1 half. So it's 2 times 1 minus epsilon, which converges to log 2 when epsilon goes to 0, which is telling you that somehow this missing point is at finding a distance from A. Okay? The space this metric is not really complete. On the other hand, what is the distance from, from C to A? Well, uh, this little loop of size epsilon gets stretched to all the way to 1 half. So this will be 1 over, so this is log of uh, 1 over 2 epsilon. And that goes to infinity as epsilon goes to 0. So you can see, so the moral here is that you know, if somebody is selling you a ticket to outer space, just make sure, make sure that the, the round trip is included. Because coming back is a lot more expensive than, than going into our space. OK. <clears throat> OK, so the, the basic properties of this, and then, uh, yeah, OK, then we're getting into things like that. Right? The basic properties that I won't prove, but they're not all that hard to, to see. Um, as a proposition is that um, the distance between, say, gamma 1 and gamma 3 is less than or equal to the distance from gamma 1 to gamma 2 plus the distance from gamma 2 to gamma 3. So the triangle inequality holds. So this is basically because when you compose Lipschitz functions, the Lipschitz constants, constants multiply, and then you're taking the log. So this becomes a sum. And uh, the distance from gamma to gamma prime is never negative, OK? And equality only if gamma equals gamma prime. This may be uh, slightly more difficult to see. Um, so for example, here, you can, uh, there's no way to, to get all slopes to be less than 1, because then the image would have volume of stick to less than 1. And it wouldn't be surjective, but homotopy equivalence isn't surjective. 
Um, and then, of course, it's not symmetric, as we've seen. OK. Now, what I'd like to prove, and this, this, the reason I'm proving it is because it, uh, the proof introduces the concept of train tracks. You can see how natural they are. Um, there is there's another way to define the distance. Namely, uh, if you're know, motivated by this example here, we want to look at the loops in, let's say, suppose we want to think about the distance from A to B. Well, we look at the loops in A and how long they are and look at the corresponding loops in B. We have a marking to transfer these loops. And we look at the ratios of their lengths. Okay, and now we want to maximize the ratio. And that's the uh, log of that is going to also be the distance. So um, the distance from gamma to gamma prime is the soup over alpha of log of the length of, of alpha and gamma prime divided by the length of alpha and gamma. So we look at the same loop in both graphs, in gamma prime and in gamma, we look at the ratio of their lengths, and then we take the log. And the soup of that is going to be the distance. So you can see that the original definition is in terms of inf. And th this is somehow a, a common thing in mathematics. Like, for example, if you, if you know about the uh, Maximal flow, minimal cut theorem. You you have somehow two you have two families of numbers, namely um, the Lipschitz possible Lipschitz constants, and you have uh, another family of numbers, namely ratios of these lengths. And it's clear that the Lipschitz constants always have to be, you know, bigger than these ratios over here. You're right. The loop cannot get stretched by a factor of two unless you have slope at least two somewhere. But the non-trivial part is to see that the infimum of those numbers is actually equal to the supremum of these. And, if, and in fact, the, the soup is realized. OK, so the proof of this uh, it involves the concept of train tracks. OK. Proof. So first of all, I know that I, 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 I can realize the uh, minimal Lipschitz constant here. This is just by the Arzelas quality theorem. Okay, so let uh, let phi, so by Arzelas quality, um, there exists a phi from gamma to gamma prime that realizes um, the, the minimal, the infimum of, of Lipschitz constants. Right, if you look at any family of Lipschitz maps from one graph to the other, that family is compact by Arzelas call. Okay, now what I want to look at is the subgraph. So let gamma naught in gamma be the subgraph where, where phi uh, maximizes its slope, maximizes. So in these examples, um, you know, in this first example, gamma naught would be the whole graph A, because on both of these edges I have maximal possible slope. If I go from B to A, then the middle edge would drop out. Gamma naught would just be this, the outside circle, right? Because on the on the third edge, the slope is strictly less. Okay. Um, and then, uh, subject to this, I want to minimize gamma naught. So we can also assume, assume among all such phi, um, the, uh, the gamma naught is minimal possible. It's minimal. You can have several different minimal gamma naughts, maybe, but there is no proper subgraph of gamma naught that's also realized in this way. This gamma naught is called the tension graph. So for obvious reasons, I mean, this is where the tension is. Right? This is the maximal stretch occurs on this subgraph. OK, so just a quick observation is that gamma naught cannot have any valence one vertices. Why? 
Why? Well, because then we could perturb the map and get rid of uh, one of the edges. So note, gamma naught cannot have valence one vertices. So why? Okay, so let's say our attention graph is red. It used to be green. When I was thinking about this, it was always green. It was called the green graph. Now it's called attention graph. And it's, it's red. <laughs> so here is, here is maybe an edge of gamma naught. And then, of course, you might have other edges you know, over here that, they're not, that don't belong to gamma naught. So what does that mean? Well, it, you know, this map phi is sending gamma naught to, is sending this edge to some, you know, to some path somewhere in, in the graph gamma prime. And then these other edges, well, who knows what they do? You know, some of them go this way. Some of them might be, maybe they overlap for the, you know, a little bit or something. We don't know. But the, uh, the slope along the white edges is strictly less than the maximum possible. And so what I'm going to do is just perturb the map by moving the image of this point to, to the right in the direction of the red. So I just take this and I, and I move it this way, just by a tiny epsilon. And that's going to relax the slope along the red edge, because its image is now going to be strictly shorter than before. So the slope will st go strictly down. And if, if my epsilon is sufficiently small, even though the, uh, the slope on, on these adjacent edges might go up, it will not catch up to the, to the maximum. Yeah, it's because it started out being strictly less. OK. OK, so that's a basic operation here. Now, to generalize this to, to what we really need, yeah, we have to um, we have to talk about a train track structure. So the point is that this gamma naught comes with a natural train track structure. What is it? It's a for every vertex of gamma naught, I can look at the adjacent edges and directions out of this vertex. Uh, they they you could think of them as being you know maybe something like the unit tangent space. Uh, you know, if the, the space is not a manifold, but these are the, 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 the ways in which you can leave the vertex, right? So you have, a, you have some vertex here. So this is not just gamma naught. You have this red graph. And yeah. So in this picture, there are four ways of leaving this vertex in the red, in the red graph. So if V in gamma naught is a vertex, and say D1 and D2, are two directions um, out of out of um, v into gamma naught. So there might be there might be other you know non-red edges attached here. We ignore those. We're just looking at uh, the directions within gamma naught. So then we write write d1 equivalent to d2 if the images. So there's sort of a derivative of of phi that sends these directions. Uh, to directions in the target graph, right? Because the thread uh, is not being collapsed. The thread goes to some non-degenerate path, and I can look at the initial uh, direction of this, right? So this, um, so this is v. There is, there is a phi of v over here, and then you know what can happen is that some of these, um, some of these directions, uh, merge, you know, map to the same direction out of phi of v, and some don't. This is exactly what happens in, in our examples. You can see um, over here, this is the, the red graph is really all of A. And you can see that these two, these two directions, if I call this one d1 and d2, they're going to be equivalent, because they both go to the direction upwards from the image vertex. And likewise, the other two edges are equivalent but you'll have two equivalence classes here. OK? So that's the, that's the, uh, okay, the equivalence relation. Maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just write, so if, you know, maybe this is, the, this is clear enough. Phi star of d1 is equal to phi star of d2. In other words, the derivative, the directional derivatives are, are equal. OK? OK, so this is an equivalence relation. It's an equivalence relation. And um, the uh, equivalence classes are called gates. Equivalence classes are gates.
Okay, so here in, in our example, we have, we have two gates at this vertex V. And the way you, you draw the, the equivalence relation is that if they're equivalent, you draw them to be tangent to each other. So the, in this example, this uh, graph A, I would draw like so. I would draw it like this. Right, so here there, there are two gates, the upwards gate and the, OK? And so now I want to call a path um, legal. So a path is legal. If, uh, if it never if it never crosses turns that are equivalent. So for example, in this in this um, picture here, let's call this edge A and this edge is B. <coughs> then uh, what, what's an example of a, so for example, A, A, um, B, I guess any positive word would be legal. Okay, so th this is legal. And what's illegal? Well, for example, A, B inverse. Right? A, B inverse, and then whatever happens before or after, this is illegal uh, because it crosses this turn. You know, so it goes from A to B inverse, and this turn is uh, in the same gate. So you should, you're sort of supposed to imagine that there's a train running around along these tracks, and the train is not allowed to make a 180-degree turn. It has to go through a vertex in a smooth way. So is that defined with tangent dots? Yes, yes. Although you, if, you have three, if you have three gates, then, then it's kind of hard to draw them in a tangent way. But you, what I'd like to do is blow up the vertex into a little infinitesimal triangle. So for instance, you know, something like this. Here's an infinitesimal triangle, and then you can have you know, like this, maybe. Here is a, a graph. This really is a vertex, but just to emphasize what the gates are, you can draw a picture like this. And then legal turns are those that, you know, that, that smoothly go through here. They don't, they don't make a sh short turn. Legal paths, legal paths don't make short turns. Okay, so that's what the train track structure is. And the feature, uh, the main observation here about these legal paths is that they get stretched exactly by this uh, maximal slope. So every, so note, legal paths. This is all in, in gamma naught, right? If you do, but not, we're not defining any kind of train track structure uh, outside of gamma naught. Legal paths in gamma naught um, get, um, get mapped by, by phi to immersed paths. And their length is multiplied by this number you know, that I didn't name. I should maybe call it lambda. But it's multiplied by, the, by this uh, you know, absolute value of phi prime, but the largest slope, right? Because each edge gets uh, stretched by that factor. But two consecutive edges, you know, they form a legal term. So the, 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 you know, they're only going to be backtracking. They're, they'll continue on in the, in the direction that makes the path immersed. Can, or you can, can you call these train tracks? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the, yeah, this structure here is called a train track. The structure on this graph is called a train track. So, um, so a train track structure on the graph is this, uh, you know, this equivalence relation like we had before. So it's this, um, is the, is the structure of gates, of gates at every vertex. So that at every vertex we have at least two gates. There are at least two gates. 
So the point of having two gates is that the train doesn't get stuck. You know, it, it, it enters one of these vertices. Well, there's always a way to get out of the vertex in a legal way. And so you keep doing the, to keep running the train until, until it closes up, until it gets to the same edge with the same orientation, and then, then it closes up. So that gives, you, that gives you that these things always have legal loops. Legal loops always exist. And so what I have to do to, to convince you that the proposition holds is that I just have to show that uh, at every vertex there are at least two gates. And then we'll be done, right? Because we just find one of these legal loops and it gets stretched by exactly that amount and, that's a, and that's, that's, um, that realizes the soup here. And it's going to, the that ratio will be equal then to, to phi prime, to the absolute value of phi prime. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so why are there uh, at least two gates at every vertex? Well, because, because of the same argument. So now the picture is slightly different. You have, uh, you know, here's maybe a uh, you know, picture of, you know, here's maybe, you know, instead of valence one, now you have one gate. And then, and then there are other edges, you know, that are not in gamma naught, but it doesn't really matter. So the point is that this phi is going to send all these edges in the same direction. So, you know, it look like this maybe. Of, you know, and then these white edges could, could go someplace else. That's sort of the picture. But I, I do the same, uh, I perform the same move. I just make the, I put, push this vertex, you know, instead of mapping it here, I just move it in this direction determined by the red. And that's going to relax the slope on all of these edges, which will tell me that uh, gamma naught wasn't minimal. Okay, so I have now a smaller gamma naught. And I could, I mean, I could play the, you know, I could keep going, keep, keep playing the same game until I find um, the train track structure. So that's really it. Okay, so that's, a, that's how you see um, this proposition, and it gives you the concept of train tracks. And um, let's see, in five minutes, I want to just talk about um, automorphisms um, that preserve the train track structure. Okay, so, so a train track map for an automorphism is a self-map of a graph that preserves a train, that sends legal paths to legal paths. So a train, um, so a train track map for an automorphism phi is a self-map, um, let's say, little phi from gamma to gamma of a, of a graph gamma in, in CVN. So this is a, a metric graph, and it's, a, um, it's marked, okay? That sends, that sends vertices to vertices. Legal paths, legal paths. Uh, sorry, uh, graph gamma equipped with a train track structure. Equipped with a with a train track structure that sends vertices to vertices, legal paths to legal paths. And, um, and stretches all edges by uniform factor. Uniform factor. So not just all edges, but also all um, legal paths get stretched by this uniform factor. So what's an example? You um, can have a, an example here. Okay, so for example, uh, in rank three, I can think about A goes to B inverse C, B goes to A, and C goes to B. And now it turns out that here is a, so here we need one of these pictures with a triangle. So, um, okay, and I'm also going to draw these loops uh, not all the same size because it turns out their lengths have to 
um, be different. So that this is A, this is B, and this is C. And so what, what is it that you have to check? You have to check that every edge goes, goes to something legal. Well, the only one that, that requires attention is this B inverse C. Well, B inverse C is going this way and then this way, so that's legal. And you can also see that legal turns go to legal turns. That's the other thing you have to check. And in fact, what happens is that there is a rotation here of this little triangle. Uh, the map will rotate it uh, in this direction, 120 degrees, or 2 pi over 3. Right, you see that, for example, B goes to A. So this uh, gate here will be mapped to this gate. So it preserves the structure of a, of a tra train track. How do you come up with the lengths? Well, there's a transition matrix here. See, like A goes to zero A's, one B, and one C. So here we're not paying attention to the orientations. We're just looking at how many times the image of an edge crosses another edge. Okay, so B goes to A, and C goes to B. Okay, so this is the transition matrix. It's a, it's a Perron-Trobinius matrix, and you can look at, you can, uh, so its growth is, um, is like some certain algebraic integer, and you can compute the um, Perron-Trobinius eigenvalue for this. And you can normalize it so that the sum of the entries is one, and that gives you the lengths of these edges here. Okay, and, and if you do that, then in fact this map phi does exactly what, what's advertised here. It stretches all edges by uniform factor, namely this Perron Trobinius eigenvalue lambda. And it does the same thing to all. So, so you can see that the growth rate of this automorphism, if I take, say, A or something, and I start iterating it, or any legal loop, it will be growing exponentially with this uh, base lambda, where lambda is this Perron Trobinius number. Um, there, there are various things you can read off from, from a train track representative of, a, of an automorphism. For instance, you can read off the fixed subgroup. You know, what, is the, what is the subgroup that's fixed by an automorphism? That there is a way to read that off from the train track map. The basic idea is that if I take a loop, so what does the loop look like? Well, it doesn't have to be legal. It, you know, it may, may have some illegal terms like this. Well, how can this loop be fixed by an automorphism? Well, the, what happens is that um, you know, each one of these sides. So the, the way I drew it, you know, so the, these, these vertices are illegal turns. And everything else is, is supposed to be legal. So each one of these uh, legal sides uh, has to get mapped to a, to a longer legal side, because it gets multiplied by some factor, lambda. So it, what happens is that, that you know, this is the picture. Um, each one of these sides gets stretched to some longer path. And then, and then they sort of exactly cancel here. And so after the cancellation, you get the, the, same, the same loop back. And what that means is that there's going to be a fixed point inside. You know, this little uh, segment is going to get stretched over itself. There's a fixed point. And each of, the, each of these sides has a fixed point. In other words, your fixed loop is a concatenation of these little uh, elementary paths. These are called Nielsen paths. You know, in other words, they're, you know, they're, it's a path connecting two fixed points that has exactly one illegal turn. It turns out you can compute that from this picture can compute all such paths. I, I believe this automorphism doesn't have any. So here, only the trivial um, uh, element of the free group will be fixed. But in general, you can compute this, and that tells you exactly what the fixed subgroup is. And if, if you have a loop that's not fixed or periodic, there, there could be also, you know, it could be periodic. You could, some of these things could be permuted or something. But if, if it's not fixed or periodic, then it'll have to grow at that same exact rate like the predicted by the Perron Trobinius. Because if it's not periodic, well, the, the number of illegal turns can never grow. All these, all these legal segments go to legal segments. The number of illegal turns never grows. And if it's not periodic, then the, at least one of these will have to you know, grow to infinity. And, and then, when then sort of th that length takes over. So it's, you know, there might be some little constellation where the vertices are, but um, the growth is still at the same rate that's predicted by Perron Trobinius. OK, so um, I guess I'll stop here. Thanks for listening three, three days in a row. So questions? Yes. Well, I'm sorry. I have not. Maybe I lost you at some point. What's the relevance of that metric? Of the Lipschitz metric? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't, I, yeah. 
because I mean, okay, so a long time ago, uh, we, you know, Thurston had a, Thurston, of course, developed the theory of the matrix for surface automorphisms. Yeah. And he had this idea that they should also work for other things. And, and he didn't quite, I mean, the, the statements he had, um, you know, he, he weren't exactly what, what we eventually proved, Michael Handel and I. Um, and we did, we, our proof was that we didn't use the Lipschitz metric. Well, subsequently, I, I found another proof that uses the Lipschitz metric, and it's fairly yeah. simple. And, you know, I, I can't show it here, but, you know, it, basically you, you, um, well, it's a long story. Maybe yeah. I don't yeah. want to say Anyway, there is a proof using the Lipschitz method. Yeah. And, it, and also, I mean, I think the, the train tricks show up naturally in that proposition, which is sort of fundamental for, for um, the Lipschitz metric. That's why I was going to feature it. So the type molar metric for? There is a so there is there is a various proof of of uh, of um, Thurston's theorem, the classification of surface automorphism using a technical metric. It's kind of exactly parallels this. Did anybody pay attention to the possible analysis of uh, the, this outer space equipped with this metric, or well, I say semi-metric, whatever you can call it, to the analysis of these things? Usually, you can do a lot of analysis on a metric space. Well, so there are things it's like, like geometry. That yeah, so there are things like you know, what's the completion, right? You can take, uh, you can take, you, you can talk about completion. You can see that it's not complete. So people have computed, the, the, for instance, the completion. Uh, there are various other things that um, you know, where the Lipschitz method comes in. Um, but I, I, let's see, analysis. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Yeah, well, it is more complicated. But, uh, Steve Smell paid a lot of attention to do the geometry of uh, spaces, or the metric spaces, and we will develop a sort of yeah. hard theory in it. That sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I say that if it's anybody pay attention to this sort of thing. And another last question is, what happens if you symmetrize a metric? Yeah, so you get a metric that's compatible with the topology. But the, the, so the reason that this metric is good is because the translation length. If I look at the, if I, if I look at the minimal displacement of a graph, so, so you have this automorphism, and for every graph in outer space, I can look at its image by the automorphism, and I can measure the distance. And I can then try to minimize the displacement. Just like in a hyperbolic plane, if I have a, 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 a loxodromic or hyperbolic isometry, then the, the, the displacement, displacement will, will be minimized along the axis. And exactly the same thing happens here, but you have to use the non symmetrized metric. If you want to, you, know, you, look, you look for gammas so that the distance between gamma and phi of gamma is minimal possible. That's going to give you something like an axis. It won't be exactly a line, it'll be something proper homotopy equivalent to line. But you don't, if you symmetrize, then you lose that. Yeah, well, this, uh, you imply the same. And the, the other thing is that when you take the inverse, the inverse can grow at a different rate. It yeah, doesn't have to be the same. Just point it out here. Yeah, and so the, right, so, uh, so it makes sense that the distance from gamma to gamma prime is not the same. Yes. The, the axes are going to be different, you know, they, they might be disjoint. In the dimension two, it's always good, right? In dimension two, this is the same. All, all those three groups are the same in dimension, like the SL2Z, <coughs> well, I'll have to find it in the SL2Z, uh, the mapping class group of a torus, and, uh, and out of two. Up to, find it, up to index two, they're all the same. Yes, sir. And for three generators, I think it was some non video question, right? Which you left out as such an example. Um, is it known now, like, if you write down some, some random automotive? Yeah, usually it's trivial. Um, usually, it, it's trivial. usually it's trivial, but you can, it's computable. So it's, uh, you can compute what it is. Yeah. Other questions? So what, what about asymptotic dimension? So that's a big problem. I, I'd like to solve it before I retire. <laughs> yeah. start with asymptotic dimension about the fan is finite or infinite. Uh, yes, but I don't know. So we end on an open question. Yeah, it's an open question, yes.
I mean, sort of the starting point for mapping clocks, which is that the double dimensional curve complex is finite. Well, we don't know that the analog, so there are analogous complexes here. We don't know if they're finite. The so type geodesics are missing. Is, is that the key obstruction? Yeah. Well, there are other obstructions. This is okay. just the first one. The first one. <laughs> <laughs> The Novikov conjecture is at least a rational one, is because it's a boundary amenable. Now, it depends on boundary amenable. But, uh, the, yeah, but the integral, I guess, is not known. Internal Jones is not known. All right, well, let's uh, add it.